Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, as she said, I'm Ron Douglas. I'm here talking on behalf of the Educational Advancement Foundation and a group that's been formed here. Let me just give you just a brief history of where we are and why to, to some extent. And then, well, the plan is I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to turn it over to Tina who's going to tell you some of the things we've been thinking about. And then we're going to turn it over to all of you to tell us either your response or your reactions or what we sh how we should be thinking. Uh, as you heard this morning from Mr. Lucas, uh, this is the 16th uh, Legacy Conference. After the, I wasn't around at the beginning for the first several years, but after the first perhaps up to five years of getting, of getting together annually, the group decided that in fact it shouldn't be just talking about IBL or inquiry-based learning. It would be good if it started talking about how it might be able to increase and develop IBL, the use of IBL in mathematics departments and programs around the country. This was, what this resulted in over the years was there were centers created at five universities uh, whose purpose was to develop and enhance IBL and to, and to have graduate students, postdocs, and faculty, and people that would be using the courses and have experience in doing this. These centers have continued uh, uh, to present, and in fact, on Saturday, as every legacy meeting for the last, I guess, almost 10 years, there'll be a report talking about what's been happening. And in this year, the title of that is what we have learned about IBL at the centers or in the centers program. Beyond that, we've also gone on. In other words, a journal was created, the Journal of Inquiry-Based Learning of, uh, of, of scripts for use in various courses. Uh, other uh, materials have come out of the centers. Uh, in the last few years, we've created ABLE, the Academy for Inquiry-Based Learning, which is basically a website that provides information and a way to communicate with people in the community. And we've also uh, had over the last, I guess, maybe three or four years, a small grants program for people interested in trying to institute IBL at their, in their department by themselves or in groups or in various other projects as far as that's concerned. This is... Most of this activity has been supported by the Educational Advancement Foundation, and in some cases by Harry Lucas himself. We've also managed to garner grants from the National Science Foundation and a few other places for carrying this out. And I should mention one other part of this. Uh, a, a substantial assessment and evaluation program was funded about three or four years ago, headed by Sandra Larson. And you've heard about that, 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 those activities, and you'll again hear a report of that. I think it's on Saturday also. The, which brings us kind of to the present. In other words, a, a the, the, as a result of these activities and, and others, a, an IBL community has been formed or has grown. Maybe I should put, should put it that way because I'm not sure how much we directly had to do with all of this, but in any case, that's the case. We've been looking at the question, and the question was raised by Mr. Lucas himself as to kind of what comes next. In other words, how should we keep going? Well, one of the, as I'm sure most of you know, much of the activities we're talking about involves money of one kind or another. And right now, the amount of money that's being given generously by the Educational Advancement Foundation and by Mr. Lucas has been substantial. But if you want to grow the program much more, one's going to have to start thinking about other monies. And, and that's what, one of the things we've been trying to do over the last few years. When you start thinking about that, then you realize that, in fact, some of the questions which we've either not answered or taken for granted, namely what should the structure of these activities be, comes to the fore. Because if you're going to try to convince somebody else to give you money, you have to be able to explain what it is you're doing, how you're going to do it, and what your goals are. In any case, uh, about a year, almost a year ago, a strategic planning committee was formed by Mr. Lucas and Tina Straley and Bill Hamilton are the chairs of that and a variety of other people uh, are on the committee of about 10 people and most of us are here to now. What I'm going to ask you, to, I'm going to ask, turn it over to Tina Straley at this point and I'm going to ask her to tell you something about what we've been thinking about, what we've not made any firm decisions. There's, there's, there is no report, there is no recommendations, there's nothing to spring into action at this point, but we're getting to the place where we've explored and talked about a range of options, which she's going to tell you about next. 
After that, then I'm going to, as I said, turn the mic over to you guys to talk about questions, explanations from us, suggestions, advice, whatever. Tina. Hi, I can use whatever little height I can garner, so I'll stand up rather than sit. Uh, first of all, picking up where Ron left off and turned it over to me, um, let, let me give you um, a list of reasons for the strategic planning. Mr. Lucas, as Ron said, has been a force behind the IBL movement in mathematics as the motivator, leader, financial supporter for over 20 years. And he would like to find ways to expand the funding, funding sources and to identify new leaders um, to, to carry on the, the movement and the projects and, and the, the community far into the future. The IBL, I'll call it a movement because I don't know what other noun to use, has grown significantly over this time and has potential for much greater growth. And expanded financial support can uh, enhance the ability to grow. If the IBL movement is to grow significantly, there must be efforts to diversify the populations of students who benefit, to collaborate with national efforts of education reform, and to increase the visibility for IBL nationally. As the IBL movement has matured, there's now a need for some kind of structure that is sustainable and can continue to encourage and support the IBL community far into the future. So there are three things that we have looked at. One is creation of such an organizational structure that brings together the advocates in the community to maintain this vibrancy and enthusiasm that we see here at this conference, and an organizational structure in which this community is fully engaged. To identify the leaders of the community for now and into the future, and a way to pass on that leadership to new generations. To expand the funding that is available to meet the needs of a growing and evolving community. And to, um, going back to the organizational structure, a structure that can raise, handle, and expend that funding. So these needs are obviously interconnected. I, I talked about three things, but then I, I kind of talked about more than one in each of those points. For example, to raise funding, there needs to be an entity that has a vision and goals to reach that vision, and evidence that what it's doing is accomplishing those goals. So the organization must make the case for the success of IBL in improving mathematics education. We, the members of the Strategic Planning Committee, don't have all these answers. I'm not here today to say, OK, here's the problems, and here's what we're going to do about it. In fact, we don't want to have those answers until we hear from you. So yes, we've talked about a lot of possibilities, and I'll describe some of those, but nothing has been decided. And you may come up with possibilities that we haven't even considered. So that's the point we are today. And that's why we're coming to you now before we try to draft any kind of decisions um, to go forward. Now, to be a bit more specific, what kind of organization are we talking about? Well, we do know that we want a public nonprofit because a public nonprofit can raise funds. The EAF is a private foundation and other foundations and even large individual donors don't like to contribute to a different foundation. 
that they'll contribute to a public nonprofit with the purpose of expanding and supporting IBL. So now, that doesn't mean that's all decided because a public nonprofit can be a charitable organization or it could be a membership organization or it could be some kind of combination of both. I mean, there are some things like the American Cancer Society, if you contribute, they say you're a member, but you really don't have any voice in it. And we think we want an organization where the community has a voice. So again, it's not worked out, but those are the kinds of things we've been thinking about. If there is an organization, what is its relationship with the Educational Advancement Foundation? Well, we would certainly want that to continue to be a close relationship, but legally, if this is a public nonprofit, it has to be a separate organization. Now, how separate? Certainly, you can have leadership shared between the two. You can have a close financial relationship. But legally, to raise money, it would have to be a new entity. Um, the, the other um, ideas that we have been looking about at is, um, what of the programs and projects that EAF funds should be overseen by this entity? And nothing of that has been decided. Uh, certainly, if you want to raise money, you want to have a nice set of projects that looks, that, that looks good to a funder, that covers the country and covers different levels. So I don't think we, we want, um, for example, uh, the centers to be removed from AIBL. But there's still lots of possibilities. For example, the small grants program could continue to be run out of EAF. But I think what you want to present to a funder, a foundation, is um, an, an, a very um, comprehensive set of programs and projects. So, um, I really don't have, I, I mean, Ron said I would give you a whole lot of details, but I don't really have details because that's why we're coming to you for ideas. But I think you get the idea of the fact that we want to go after funding, we want to support the community, we want an organization that can continue into the future, and that you, the community, are fully engaged in. And I think uh, it's time to turn this over I know sometimes you don't have comments and questions immediately, but we'll give you a little time to sit and think about it. And um, as soon as you have comments, questions, whatever, this is the time. No, no, you have to go to one of the mics. There, there, there's a mic on it. There, there's, a, there's a microphone on each side. And if you want to ask a question, please go. Identify yourself, your university or college, and then ask your question. Uh, okay, I won't do that. I'll ask the question. I'm Sarah Marie. Um, I don't really have a real affiliation, so. Well, that's okay. Tina, is there a bunch of foundations that you have in mind that you think would fund the work that we're talking about? Well, there are a wide variety of foundations in the United States that support education of one, at one kind or another. We've, over the years, we've talked to a number of them. Some of the centers have managed to get small grants from some of these foundations. Uh, we have been talking to some of the others. And again, there's certainly no guarantee that we're going to get money for any of these projects. But what is, is almost 100% certain is if we don't have a public foundation of some sort, we're not going to be able to get money. So it, it might be an experiment. You know, we hope it's going to be um, a positive experiment and that we've laid the groundwork. But as Ron says, I'd rather not give the names at this point. But yes, we have made overtures. We have gotten back um, some exciting interest. Other questions, comments from anybody out here? I, I should add, uh, the, the expectation or the plan certainly is that the legacy conferences, will, the yearly legacy conferences will go on, whether it's part of EAF or part of this new is not clear, but there's no, it, it, I think everybody has agreed that these are imp very important uh, 
activity is a very important activity to maintain interest in IBL, to spread it, and to allow people to network and get together. Ron, I forgot to introduce the Strategic Planning Committee. Oh, well, let me do that now. In other words, uh, in addition to the people that you see up here in front, there's a, the group was, a, was it nine or ten people? Would everybody that's on the Strategic Planning Committee stand up? Now. We know where you live. The reason I'm identifying the people here is, is that we're having this meeting, this session, very early in the conference for the, for the following reason. You, as Tina said, you, questions may not occur to you now. You may not want to ask them to the whole audience, or you may think of some of these things. We're all going to be around tomorrow. We're all going to be around on Saturday morning. So if you catch, or we're going to be around at the, at the reception, the cocktail reception a little later, and, and, and the dinner. So if you see one of us and have a question, by all means, feel free to ask us individually or in groups or whatever as to, or, or if you've got suggestions, by all means, tell us what the suggestions might be. Questions? Yes, Hi, over here. Lorenzo Sedun, University of Texas. Um, my question is, this plan is to ramp up and raise more money. Now, the question is, what are you going to do with the money? Is the idea to just scale up the activities that you've currently been doing, or is there going to be a redirection of the focus of the efforts? Well, that's not something we've decided ourselves. In fact, it's not up to us to decide. But, I mean, I can tell you what my own reaction would be. One is we would certainly enhance the activities we currently have underway. It's, I think, also clear that we, we could certainly enlarge the small grants programs. We would surely have more workshops around the country targeted to different groups of people with uh, perhaps even small grant programs associated with workshops. Uh, possibly, if there was enough additional money, we'd create other centers. Uh, and, and, of course, anything people came up with. It, it, the, ex the idea would be that if we had a public foundation with, which raises funds, one would be able to submit proposals and projects to it. It would have decide on what it wanted to, to endorse, to validate, to, to, to shop around for funding. In other words, it, in some ways, it might, you might think of it as being a kind of a middleman. In other words, between the people, good proposals and good ideas that people and the community would have and the funders. Uh, if, if, you've, if you've put yourself in a position of trying to explain and sell IBL to your colleagues, even in the ones at the colleges, your co colleges, the colleges and universities, often it's the case that it's not so easy to do. It's not always apparent to people what the advantages are or why one wants to do it. One of the things we've done over the last few years, as I said, is, a, is to fund the assessment and evaluation activities. We now have at least some evidence, and we would expect to get more evidence, that. IBL is effective. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Others can chime in. Um, yeah, I want to say something about that. IBL is very promising. It's shown to be very effective. But if you look across the country, it's still only employed in a small percentage of classes. So there's tremendous potential here for greater growth. And um, you know, Bill wrote a little note. No, you don't raise money just for the sake of raising money. But the, we see real needs. For example, the uh, assessment that Sandra Larson did was, was very illuminating. It was very uh, good. The, the results were positive. But um, it was really just a first stab at it. And a lot of the, the funders ask for more detailed information. Uh, we need more information on how uh, IBL affects diverse communities because that, that's an, you know, an important question, but it's also an important question to donors. And so there's, there's tremendous potential for growth, but if we stay where we are now, that's going to be very difficult. Let me just add one more thing. In the original plans for the centers, a key part of the program was going to be the possibility for people coming from colleges and other colleges and universities to visit there either on sabbatical or 
for a semester or for a month or something like this, where they would participate in the IBL program there and learn how to do it. Unfortunately, we've not been able to do that because that requires funds. If you're on sabbatical, most places you get half salary. Somehow, someplace you have to come up with the other half. So th that would be an example of a kind of program we might be able to fund if, uh, if in fact, one were able to raise more money. And it wouldn't have to be at the, one of the four or five centers that we currently have. It could be at other places. I mean, there's a small grants program could be enlarged. Right now, it's a few thousand dollars. You can't do what I'm talking about with that much money. But if you had the possibility of twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars or something a person, you could do something like that. And and I think you'd agree, going someplace and working with an experienced IBL instructor would certainly be one of the mo mo most effective ways of learning how to do it. Most of the people here probably already know that, but we're knowing. As, as the, when the hands were raised earlier today, many of the people, if not, mo I guess most of the people are experienced. But we're now talking about how do you enlarge this group? How do you make IBL available to a much larger group? And how do you make the ability or the learning of doing IBL available to a larger group? So those are just some ideas. Other questions, comments? Yes. Randy Cohn, Virginia Military Institute. Hi. Uh, does a vision statement uh, exist currently by the Strategic Planning Committee, or are you asking us to help you develop that? We have, that's one of the things we've talked about. We have a draft, but a very rough draft of a vision statement. And of course, you're exactly right. I mean, the can we make that public so that we can read that and react to it over the course of the next two days? I'm not sure over the next couple of days. Uh, you're going to hear at the end, we are going to be asking for feedback for further on. But certainly, uh, th th those kinds of, uh, would you want to, okay, go ahead. I mean, I with, with the understanding that this is not just not carved in stone, but in fact, it's not even in ink. That's why we were reluctant to distribute it, because then it sort of takes a life up on of its own. But. Something I was going to announce at the end, I'll just mention briefly now. Following this um, conference, we're going to send each of you a questionnaire that has lots of boxes to write in. So it's not just, yes, no, I agree with this, I disagree with this. It's really searching for your suggestions and, and ideas. But the vision statement, we have a three-part thing. We have vision, mission, and goal. And, and I don't want you to write it down. Just sort of get the flavor of it. The vision is to improve education across the United States by ensuring that all students learn to think critically, can solve problems independently, and can routinely solve non-routine problems. The mission is to strengthen mathematics education through fostering critical thinking and problem-solving by providing all students with at least one inquiry-based learning experience in mathematics and more for students in STEM fields at the university college level. And the goal is to support and grow the community of mathematics faculty and teachers who teach by IBL methodology and provide IBL resources and activities for students. So I don't think it's very controversial. Yeah. Now, uh, and one of the things I might want to add is I'm, su I'm sure that many of you, if not most of you, have experienced res uh, the effects of your being one or two, in other words, a minority of people in your department that use IBL. One of, the, what, one of the things we would like to, as a result of what we're talking about, these activities eventually, to not only increase the number of people that use IBL methods uh, in teaching, but we, to, incre to increase the acceptance of the general mathematics community of IBL as a legitimate, effective way of teaching mathematics. And that's something that would be good for even the most experienced IBL instructor. Any other questions, comments? Hi. I'm Christina. I'm actually a fourth year graduate student in chemistry, so my comments are going to be a little bit from the outside in. Um, and so I don't know a lot about what you all do, but I know what goes on in my particular field, and that a big part of, I think, identifying leaders, which is one of the things you said in particularly, or like identifying them and training them, I think is going to be needing to target graduate students. 
I think graduate school hasn't changed a lot in the last couple hundred years, and we don't really learn how to teach. And eventually, we've got to go on and become teachers. And so I think if you can find more ways to target us and also just help students. I went back to school, married with a child, not necessarily an easy thing to do in STEM. And so I think finding ways to actually bring more people into graduate school who traditionally would not go to graduate school and then having tools for them to learn how to become IBL teachers or Pogol teachers in my field is kind of the big terminology. Um, I think it's one of the things that a new foundation should or a new organization should definitely promote. Thank, thank you very much. One of the things I'll, comments I'll make is at all of the centers that we currently have, an important part of the activity is in, in, involving graduate students in teaching using IBL. And in, if I'm in, sometime this summer, I know that Harvard is offering a workshop on basically for, for graduate for te preparing graduate students to teach using IBL. Or actually, I'm preparing graduate students to teach with one of the possibilities being IBL, I guess is a better way to put it. Other questions? I think we had somebody over here. No, still no, it's over, right. still over here. Sorry. Oh, first of all, I'm delighted to see how active this side of the room is. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I'm really glad that to hear us talking about um, the predisposition of, of other faculty to begin considering and using what we might say a broad tent IBL methods. And I, I too have been at first surprised and then perhaps disappointed that some of the, my colleagues um, seem to have um, little um, interest in this direction, even when there is increasing pretty clear and serious evidence that this, uh, very, you know, very good empirical evidence that this would be um, the best thing for our students. And what's interested me is that some colleagues of mine, not in my department, but my institution, have recently done a preliminary study about maybe it's not specifically IBL, but alternative um, means of teaching in, in, in the university. And what they've discovered, it seems, is something quite interesting, and that is that um, it's perhaps not enough to motivate, that, to motivate faculty to change the way they teach. It's not enough for there to be convincing evidence that it's better for their students. It seems that the greatest motivation may be what it will do for the faculty themselves. Um, and in particular, whether faculty will find it more rewarding personally to teach a certain way. And so I simply want to throw this out. I don't know if it's a question, um, <laughs> it's an observation, it's a thought that um, I think in the long term, uh, faculty are going to have to feel that this will be a more rewarding way for them to teach um, in order to wish to adopt these kinds of changes. And I'm interested in whether anyone else has, has thoughts about this sort of issue that's recently popped up in my mind. Thank you very much. I, I agree with you completely in that. Other questions or comments? Ron, Ron, if yes. I, if I could. Go ahead. Can you hear me okay? No. You need to put it really close. Get near the phone. I'm supposed to say sort of three idiot words so it knows to hear me. Now, I've said those words. I'm Bill Hamilton, and I'm one of the two non-mathematicians on the Strategic Planning Committee, and you know where the other one is, right there, Ed Honored. But specifically, I'm the one bureaucrat on the committee. And one of the questions that has not been decided, we've not been told, nor have we decided what type of organization uh, may emerge from this process. Uh, we are definitely interested in your input, so one of the questions I'll put out there now, we don't have to answer it obviously right now, and you have the rest of the conference to think about it. That's why we're doing this session at the beginning of the conference and not at the end. But one of the questions we're interested in hearing from you on, both now and later, is what type of organization would you like to see emerge from this process? That's my question, and I'll be interested in comments now or later. Other members of the team were Bob Daverman. Bob, you raise your hand again. Ed Honert, you saw. Judith Covington. Uh, Albert Lewis. Tom Ingram. And I think Nathaniel Dean is a member, but he's not, he's not here today. Stan uh, Yoshinobu as well. So I'll just put that question out there for now or for later. Thank you. Let me just add one. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, question. Yes. Um, the statement you read a little while ago, I noticed it did not have the name R.L. Moore in it. I know that 
IBL is the popular buzzword now, and buzzwords are how you get funding, but I would propose that in line with Mr. Harry Lucas's vision for us that the name R.L. Moore should be somewhere in the vision statement. Go ahead. Usually when you um, create an organization, you have a short uh, vision, mission, and um, goal statement. And then you actually have an elaboration of that. And I, I think what you said is, is appropriate. And I think in every time we've talked about the elaboration, we talk about this being the, um, the uh, I don't know what, what word to use here, but having been started by Professor R.L. Moore. So it, would, it will be very prominent, and we certainly can, on the questionnaire, I'd ask you to think about massaging it and how you might suggest to work it in higher up. Other questions or comments? Hey, no. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I was uh, asked by Bill to just chime in on the uh, the why. So just why IBL is being used. It's a buzzword. It's all. It's a word that's uh, I think gaining traction. It's being recognized more widely in our profession, and it's also uh, uh, related to problem-based learning or discovery-based learning, which is used in other fields and at other levels. So that's one of the reasons why we're we're using IBL as as the as the branding for this organization. And, but there's also no name, right? We have for no this. Name. So this is still early days, so. At one time I called it the inquiry-based learning organization. I mean, it could be the R.L. Moore organization. We, we, <laughs> that's one of the things that you might think about. Um, R.L. Moore inquiry-based learning organization probably is a little lengthy, but you know, that's on the table to come up with a, a good name. Yes. Go to the mic. Go ahead. Yeah. Who's yeah, talking? One there, and then one to the left. I? I'm sorry. Ron, you have one to the right. Both mics. Uh, go ahead, on the right then. Okay. My name is Vilma Mesa. I'm at the University of Michigan. And one suggestion that I have is to uh, consider the possibility of including faculty who are adjuncts are also faculty who teach at community colleges. If you think about the amount of teaching that they are doing and the little support that they have, that is a very big constituency. Another option is to also talk to the American Association of Two-Year Colleges, Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges, AMATIC, which is an organization that tries to house a lot of these uh, faculty. Thank you very Thank much. You. And now on the left. Yes, over here on the left. Let's see if I can get this down. <clears throat> Um, I'm, tra I'm Travis Mavis uh, from DynCorp International at JSC Avionics in Houston, NASA. <clears throat> I also do adjunct teaching at Laterno University and some at uh, HCCS, Houston Community College, from time to time. It seems to me that what's proposed here is that we have two approaches from what I've been listening to. One is to offer at least one IBO course or suggest that to universities and colleges, I suppose in mathematics or others. And the other thing I think of might be another approach would be to have supplementary courses attached to your regular courses. Because personally, I don't see this turning into uh, the University of Texas in the 60s and 70s, uh, where I come from, <laughs> and uh, where you had a lot of straight IBL courses. I think that today's uh, curriculum is so demanding, like at HCCS, there's 170,000 students now and they have a big pressure on them to go through a lot of material. So I see maybe a supplementary IBO course on the side, if it was math, for instance, saying that we prove theorems over here and then we race through the curriculum over here. That's, to me, that might get financed and it might get accepted by the colleges and universities. There's nothing in anything that we're talking about that precludes that possibility, indeed. At a number of the centers, there are courses very much along the lines of what you're talking about. So these kinds of IBL courses, are IBL supplemented courses, whatever, however you want to put it, are in fact being considered. At Michigan, for example, the calculus program that's there, in fact, involves IBL, but it's not an IBL course per se. 
So th there's nothing in what we're talking about that says it has to be one way or the other. In the wording that uh, Tina read, it suggested the one IBL course. Uh, ob obviously, most of us would like even more than that, but it, it, you're right. Now, there's, it, making, you don't want to make it too rigid for all the reasons you've indicated. And, and I, let me just respond to the question of the two-year colleges and, so, and adjuncts. Again, per se, there's nothing that we're talking about that excludes uh, two-year colleges or uh, adjunct faculty. I mean, as far we've not had any programs directed to the two-year colleges, but as far as I know, there's no reason somebody couldn't, in the small grants program, they couldn't apply. But of course, we- I had, well, I had one more comment. Um, I think that if you look at all the different books and curriculums that are out there, they're by the hundreds. And I think that uh, if you had something like a generic course to match any calculus course or a generic course to match any uh, statistics for managers course in business, for instance, that might go over. Now, the biggest problem is writing those generic courses. When you write an IBL a course in which the student proves the theorems for themselves, which I, of course, advocate, takes a lot of skill to write the course itself. And obviously, H.S. Wall's book, very good at that, and R.L. Moore was too. But that's the first key. Now, you have to be able to match those two as you plot along in your usual way. And then over here, I would suppose, have theorems in a generic f fashion so that that material would sell and go with any calculus, if you would. That would be my idea. So maybe we can mull that over. Can I respond? Go ahead. I, I think you're, we're, we're getting into um, really proof of why we need additional funding to try additional formats and ways to deliver courses using IBL. And there, there's a, a lot of exciting things going on um, at the uh, University of Texas uh, IBL is being infused in, the, in a large calculus reform um, project. And there are people who are experimenting with flipped classrooms so that the routine stuff can be done outside of the classroom and inside the classroom. You devote time to problem solving and critical thinking and IBL kind of activities. Um, there's even someone who's considering developing a MOOC <laughs> using IBL, see if we could pull that off. So I think there's lots of exciting things going on to try to expand, diversify the platforms, the delivery of courses using IBL. And I, I think this is more proof of why we need more funding and more expansion. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in higher education and we don't want to see those challenges crowd out the use of IBL. Yeah, I would simply underline what Tina said. As I was saying before, there, there's nothing to stop. Most, most of the suggestions we've had, there's nothing inherent in what we've been doing to prevent those projects from being funded, except we don't have the money to do it. On the right. Uh, yes, sorry. Hi, I'm Amy Kassir, uh, US Naval Academy. And I um, just wanted to put this idea out there and I mean no disrespect, but that tying this organization very tightly to R.L. Moore himself um, is not an uncomplicated proposition. That's all. You don't want to expand on that? No, come on. <laughs> <laughs> that, that Sounds like you could start a good discussion. <laughs> but that's another discussion. Wow. Any other? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mike Agliardo at uh, Cal Lutheran University. I wanted to address one of the questions you all asked about what type of organization, and at the risk of, of asking a stupid question in front of a large group of people, could you expand on what you mean by that question? Uh, yeah. I'll give a couple of examples. One, this could be a charitable organization, um, like the Cancer Society or the World Wildlife Fund, and some of those um, you you pay dues and they call you members, but you don't really participate. Um, or or you're, asked for, you're asked for a contribution. And if right, you make I mean, you're really just contributing and, and they get most of their funds from large uh, corporations and so forth. So it could be a charitable organization. It could be a professional society where 
really you do have members and your your leadership is is um, elected. Um, so those are kind of two extremes, or it could be something in in between. Um, and we don't know what's the best way to go. Uh, I mean, professional society sounds very democratic, but you have to have a community who's willing to join and do the work. Charitable sounds very easy, but then you may not have enough community support for it. So uh, it's not clear to us. Certainly, if you've got a membership organization where, which, where people pay dues, if you go to somebody else and ask them for money for this project or something else, you've got argument number one is all these people support this activity. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to carry the day, but it is a, is a good start for that. But uh, on the other hand, as Tina said, it, it's complicated. And that's what we're, we're looking to you guys to give us feedback on what you would think about this. And some of the questions that we talked about on that yeah, questionnaire will be more details about that. Other questions, other comments. And as I said, th this discussion does not have to end here today. We'll be around all day, we'll be around the rest of the night, the tomorrow. evening. Which way? Right. Oh, right. Oh, okay, the right continues. Right. Jed Herman from the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. There's been a lot of discussion about what t sort of groups could be benefit from this, and I think one group that wasn't mentioned is high schools. If one, if one of the goals is to have every student encounter an IBL course, um, I think well, many many students come to college never taking another math course. And I think it may be a big challenge um, convincing um, the people in charge of curricula to um, allow a course like this. So I think a lot of um, attention could be done to try to get every high school to have one course like this. I mean, that's, that's a good point, and we should have uh, mentioned it earlier. At the centers, we currently have all of the centers, in, uh, at least all of the four, that uh, Michigan, Chicago, Santa Barbara, and Texas all have in pre-service programs in which IBL is an in, in important part so that the teachers that are currently being prepared, many of them have in-service programs doing the same thing. And some of them have outreach to the local schools for exactly the reasons you're talking about. But that is a big challenge. But of course, that is, you're absolutely right. If you want to change things, you're, in many ways, the college, college level is too late. If you notice, the, the mission statement that I read didn't mention level of education. Right. There was a reason for that. Yeah, we're thinking about it broad, more broadly. Yes. Is there a question over here? Melvin Zeter from Illinois Wesleyan University. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I think would be very important is a new way to enter the mathematics pipeline. I don't think the standard calculus student uh, uh, sequence really inspires enough people to pursue mathematics. I'm thinking about a series of seminar uh, modeling type courses where you take students and you introduce them to mathematics using inquiry-based learning. For example, uh, you could teach a topology course uh, starting with naive set theory and do a fair amount of mathematics and teach it to freshman students. You can model a disease epidemic and, and do some statistics. You, you can model lots of things and introduce areas of mathematics like linear programming. You, you can convince people that mathematics is an important, exciting area. You're looking at a person that despised mathematics and stopped taking, his, uh, stopped taking my last math course in the 10th grade. I hated it when I went to college. I've been the chair of a math department now for about 27 years. So I know what it's like to go to college and not care about mathematics, and these long calculus sequences do not always inspire people to continue on to mathematics. So I think an IBL first year course, get them early, uh, would be a great thing that, uh, that this group could, could consider. There are some of the centers that actually have such courses. Michigan is an example that has a one-year cryptology based on cryptology course, which is a freshman seminar. 
and for which you do not need prerequisites. And some of the other centers also have such a course. But we haven't made them, they're not, they're not as widespread, known as widely as they should be probably. A, a lot, again, what it comes down to, a, a lot of things that, not just at the centers and the things that we're involved in, but good things are happening in a lot of places. But if you want to disseminate them and replicate them other places, to a large extent, a lot of that comes down not just to people wanting to do it, but it also comes down to some money. Got that one wrong. Okay. Question? Is there a timeline on the uh, decision-making process, i.e. before the next I'm conference, assuming, after any, well, any well, sort I'm of... I'm assuming we're probably going to be making a final report sometime early fall. Okay, thank you. I mean, we are serving at the pleasure of Harry Lucas. Other questions? On the right. Hi, I'm back. Um, this time I have a clarification question. Um, I think that most of us aren't familiar with the sort of um, different types of organizations that you mean and like what are, the, what are the differences between them? Like for instance, you talked about a charitable organization like the Cancer Society and you talked about a membership organization and you talked about a professional society. Is the professional society technically it's, it's a, a membership organization. It's a membership. So, so those two are the same. Are those the only two possibilities that you're considering? Or are no. there other sort of legal types of organization that you're thinking of? I mean, if somebody wants to, I'm not sure that we've thought of anything else. As Tina indicated, there's something in between, there are things possibly in between the two. That kind of blend them. Blend them. But uh, if, if you can come up with some other proposal, that would, that's why we're here. Okay, I don't want to scare you all. Um, that you have to vote for one of these. On the questionnaire, there's kind of leading questions asking about what kind of involvement you want to have. And it's out of that that we'll make a better decision. So we're kind of feeling the community as to how much you would want to participate. And I, and I should add that also on the questionnaire, some of these questions about you should try looking at this or you should try looking at that. One of the open questions is what other things that we're not necessarily doing now would you think that if we get money we should invest it in? Right. So I mean, you, you have the opportunity for that response too. But we knew that we couldn't just say do you want this kind of organization or that because you don't have all the information. So it's based upon other wishes that you will express. Ron, this Bill. Yes, Bill. Ron. I think the genuine conversation that we do want to have is to maintain, at least maintain and perhaps enhance where we can this one particular strength of the organization as it is today, and that is the energy and the creativity of folks like you. So that's why this is a genuine conversation to say, what kind of organization can you envision that you can participate in and be part of a, shall we say, democratic process because the strength of the education process is, a, is that kind of a process. Certainly, I doubt we would want to have a top-down organization where there is one you know, authority setting timelines, setting missions, setting goals, et cetera. So, but I think the questionnaire will give you a structure by which you can give us your honest input as to, yes, this is the type of organization that I can continue to participate in and thrive and give ideas so that the IBL effort or more effort or whatever we want to call it can not only be maintained but enhanced. And so. It, it, as I say, it's a genuine question. It's, it's not a question that we haven't thought of. It's a question that we have thought of so much that we want to make sure we get your ideas as part of that process. And yes, we are responding to Harry Lucas's challenge, but we're also here to respond to your suggestions so that those two can come together before we're done with this process in the next few months. Over here on the left. Ha have there been discussions uh, centered about uh, trying to formalize a definition for inquiry-based learning because there's there's this kind of a springboard more the more methods kind of a springboard for that idea in this room 
But one of the great challenges, in my opinion, once you get out of this room is, what does IBL mean? Yes. And if you look in the literature, it's not at all clear. Yes. And I would, I would be challenged as a, as a donor to give to something that's so vaguely defined. And I think we need to move towards a universal definition of that. Yes. So there's a question on, on the questionnaire for you to describe an IBL course in 50 words or less. Start thinking about it. <laughs> Having said that, I don't think we want to make such a tight definition of IBL that there'll be people, it'll be possible to say that that is and that's not. In other words, in some firm way. In other words, uh, that's, uh, maybe some people here would like to be able to do that, but in fact, one of the strengths of what we've been doing over the last 10 or 20 years is in fact we've allowed, we've, as you've indicated, uh, the nature of IBL or what we consider IBL has, has broadened. And of course, it may have, we don't want it to broaden to the point where it's no different from anything else. But we do want, there are some principles and we want, to, and that's what I think one could give, articulate the principles involved in an IBL course. Yes. Okay. Over here. I'm Caroline with Lee University. Um, I go back to what Mike uh, started here. Um, the main idea that I see here is you want to go from a private organization to a public organization because of funding? Is that the main reason? No, we, we want to raise funds. That's the, the main thing. We want to be able to expand IBL. We want to be able to put more resources into it. That's the goal a way to do that so that we can go out and raise large amounts of money is to create an organization that can raise the money and accept it. The goal, you know, the goal of this organization is, is really to improve education by spreading IPL. And, and, and you may come back and say, don't create an organization at all. Let everybody do their own thing. That's a possibility as well. We're, we're, we don't have to create anything. So you're, you're expecting to get more funding by being, going public? Is that? Well, we can't get funding now from other sources because private foundations uh, and, and private individuals, for the most part, will not give money to a private another private foundation. But, it, but we don't have to create anything. We can, we can say the IBL movement is at a point where it can go I, on. I mean, we could simply say, for example, that these good ideas that we've heard in here that I've indicated we can't do now because we don't have funding is, you guys are perfectly capable of going out and finding your own money. Right. Well, okay, maybe yes, maybe no. But we think that they're in union their strength as far as that kind of thing is concerned. And without infrastructure, and for example, it's not just a question of whether, what does IBL mean, but how does IBL fit in assessment, a whole lot of other things. That's, I mean, that's what we've been trying to provide is the underpinning and the infrastructure for those kinds of activities. Uh, was there one more, or is that it? It was one more, but it has to be quick. Okay, one more quick question, because we were wrapping up. Um, the, I, I am curious whether there is research from business people who have studied how organizations, one of the things that attracts me from this um, conference and all these group is that there is no membership, that you come because you want to come. So that I would be worried that with a membership organization, we would lose that uh, and that we would see dwindling our numbers just because now we have to pay. So I wonder whether there is some research about um, how organizations, nothing. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. In fact, Sandra Larson is proposing such a study, how do, how do communities come together and what sustains them. Um, and I said, gee, I wish we had the results now. Um, there, there are two things that I, I want to point out in, in closing. Um, one, again, the, the questionnaire that you're going to be receiving by email. Um, if you just go through the, the questions, you could probably answer them all pretty quickly in 10 minutes. If you want to write an essay in each box, well, 
I don't know how long it takes you to, to write large, um, uh, big answers. So, you know, 10, 15 minutes, um, maybe as much as 20 to 25 minutes if you want to take the time to um, really answer some questions more creatively. Uh, the other thing is, as the community has grown, there is more uh, proposal pressure uh, to EAF and to Mr. Lucas, and so we do have to move to a little bit more formal um, uh, process than we've had before. It has been very much write a letter, and Mr. Lucas considers it, and the EAF board considers it. But in order to be fair to the community and to more strategically and um, with more due diligence uh, grant those requests, we have been actually using a small review committee that advises um, Albert Lewis and uh, Harry Lucas on, um, on grant funding, and we're going to have to move to uh, having um, a solicitation with deadlines, hopefully several through the year, so you don't have to wait a year if you haven't gotten something in. But we'll have to do reviewing of proposals in groups rather than individually as each one comes in. And there'll be some guidelines without trying to be too bureaucratic, but so that we make sure each of you answer the same questions so that you have a, a, a level playing field in going after the, the grant funding. And of course, a budget that, that is um, explanatory or self-explanatory. So we want you to just, if you want to write a proposal and you're planning on it, um, once we've gone to the, these methods, hopefully in the fall, just check the AIBL and the EAF website when you want to submit a grant and you'll see what the, the deadlines are. And again, we're trying not to be very bureaucratic or ask you, you know, questions. It's not going to be a 15-pager like it is for NSF. We're not going to use the NSF model, uh, something much more gentle than that, but enough so that we really can understand your project and judge it against others. Um, and those are the, the two things. I think we're at the end of our time. We really appreciate this. I did write notes, but I hope that you will take these ideas and put them into the questionnaire, then we'll have them all, and we'll be able to see really kind of the feelings of the, of the community. But we're all here now. Yeah, we're here now. Talk about it and talk to us. We'd love to hear from you, obviously. We've, we've, we are asking you, begging you to have input. So thank you again.